My first great idea is a pretty funny story. When I was, um, I was originally a lawyer, and I took a leave of absence from my law job to take care of a sick friend who came come live with my, my wife. And I was casting around just for something to keep me occupied, and I heard that pogs and slammers were a craze in Los Angeles. Uh, I don't know if most people will remember, but it's a game, pogs and slammers is a game of paper discs, and those are pogs. And kids would collect these discs, and they would go into a sort of a playground, and they'd stack the discs, one on top of the other, between, w between two friends, and throw a slammer on it. The ones that flipped over, you got to keep. So it was like casino gambling for eight and nine-year-olds. And it was a, a craze that was spreading across the country. And I knew I just, you know, I wanted to get into it. My deep entrepreneurial spirit, and I just thought I could participate. And I was driving through Arizona, and I saw a uh, paperweight with a real scorpion embedded in plastic for sale. At any time at the airport, wherever you go there, you see these scorpion paperweights. And I thought, hmm, if I could do a slammer with a real scorpion, that would be something. And so I went into my garage, just classic story, and I started mixing polyurethanes and different kinds of plastic, trying to get a little scorpion inside a, something that could be called a slammer. Um, and after about three or four months, I finally got something that wouldn't break. I brought it to a toy show in Pomona, close to my house, little teeny little corner of a little booth with a little aquarium with scorpion slammers in them. And a distributor walked up to me and said, if you don't leave this room without signing a deal, I'll buy 300,000 of those for you for $2 a piece. And I was just like blown away. And again, they, they took off like crazy because I was participating in this craze of pogs and slammers. And of course, real scorpion bugs for little boys was quite a hit. You know, over a couple years, I was surfing trends. I had participated in the yo-yo trend. That was a huge craze. I made scorpion yo-yos. And then I did fingerboards, which also was a huge craze. And w I was doing fingerboards, and I read in the Los Angeles Times that the Razor scooter was the hottest thing in Japan. So I uh, called up the factory and I said, I want to do a little miniature Razor scooter <laughs> as, you know, kind of like a little miniature skateboard. And while we were discussing it, I thought, well, maybe I'll try some, why don't I try selling some of these scooters here, too? And I put the scooter in some of my stores. I, I actually already had pretty good retail distribution at that time, Toys R Us and Walmart. Put it in a couple of stores, and they sold like crazy right out of the bat. And I knew I was onto something that could not be believed. I attribute a lot to the product. You know, uh, I, this was not a product that was marketed on TV. Um, it was just inherently a great product. So it had, as I mentioned, it was already a huge hit in Japan. So it had this, even sort of this international vibe, this momentum, um, but it was a revolutionary interpretation of the scooter. So the minute people could get on it, they could see that it was so much better. And you know, we partnered with the Sharper Image and they were instrumental in promoting it, but really uh, the consumer fell in love with the product. And because it was easy to do, easy to use, um, it spread like crazy throughout the, the whole country. And well, again, it was a craze beyond crazes. And uh, when that happens, you get imitators fast. And in today's world, imitation happens very, very quickly. So we probably had 50 50 different imitators, and all the major retailers that I was selling to were also carrying five, six, seven different types of different types of scooters at that time. Um, you know, we were able to stop the imitators in 2000 when our patent issues, but before that, the, imi the imitation was uh, insane. The copying was insane. Well, a patent can be extremely valuable once it issues. Obviously, it can uh, narrow down the market and and allow you to. Um, sell the entire market for your product. So it's extraordinarily valuable. You know, the patent has to both issue in time um, to prevent other people from entering the market um, if you're going to capture your original sales. If it doesn't, you're going to lose a lot of sales at, at the beginning. Once it issues, then you can shut down other people, but um, the patent has to be strong. And while even if initially you can shut down a lot of people who have strict just straight copied your product over time you know there's always the danger that people will figure out ways around your patent to i totally agree that you have to look for ways to improve your patent and continually strengthen it because again people are always chasing you so if you're doing well and that item doesn't just become a hit for a little while but 
stays on the market for a long time. There's a lot of ingenious inventors out there. They're going to try to figure out ways around your patent. You have to be one step ahead of them, continuing improving your product, patenting it. And to your point also, there's other uh, intellectual property uh, protections that you can get. So you can get trade dress, you can get copyright, you should really cover your product as well as you can, provided that you have the funds to do it. And you know, certainly as you get to be, as students start to make money from your patent, uh, that's when you go ahead and continually improve it. The uh, value of the brand is definitely worth more than the value of the patent. And so that's a very important lesson that uh, people shouldn't fear just because they don't have a patent that they can't make money on their product. Because if you can get out there first and become famous for introducing this product, even if people can imitate later, they'll never be the original. And that's a huge, huge advantage. As soon as the patent debt issued, we sued, I believe it was more than 25 infringers at that time. And we were successful against all of them. So it was very effective. It was very costly to um, use our lawyers to uh, enforce the patent, but it was very successful. And it, uh, but again, the brand also, later, we, we haven't had to use our patent that frequently because our brand is so strong, it's very hard for other people to even compete. Um, it was, it was hard and I think one of the pieces of advice uh, that I would give is um, it really didn't happen for me until I hired a sales professional. I, mean, I hired him on commission, but when I was first starting out, I was very jealous of my um, profit margin. And I'd say, why should I give 15% or 10% to a sales professional to go out and call on somebody like Toys R Us or Walmart? I'll just call them myself. And it seems like it's going to work that way. And of course, sometimes you can get a hold of the buyer and sometimes you can get an appointment. But just managing that relationship is much more challenging than you might think. So one of the advices I, pieces of advice I always give to people starting out is sales professionals are extremely important. No money up front. There are many, many sales professionals, sales representatives who work on commission. That is the norm. So, and you can ask them what other major companies that they're representing. You know, and, and sales professionals are also, everybody is interested in innovation and something new. And so they'd love to, you know, not everybody's immediately going to step up and buy your product and represent your product, but you can find some sales representative with a good relationship with a major retailer and they'll take it in front of them for nothing until, of course, the retailer writes the big check and then you write a little check to the, them later afterwards to pay a commission. So that's how I did it back then and I definitely how we do it today and it's the way it's done in the, in the U.S. market. Um, what they really needs to have is the ability to sell through. It's a, maybe it's a term of art, but it has to go on the shelf and sell. And so I liked, if I, was, if I was going to give advice, I would say, see if you can see if that's going to happen first on a smaller scale, because you don't want to burn a bridge with a major retailer if your product isn't, for example, at the right price or it needs some refinement. Um, but if it, they, the big retailers are also looking. They, they're not looking for single SKU companies. I think that's very accurate. But they are also looking for that next brilliant single SKU. And they realize, just like I realize, that often those don't come from the big companies. Those come out come from, you know, the millions of inventors that are out there and people with ideas. So they realize they have to take a risk if they want to get the next great thing into their store. Um, but, you know, for sure, you should not plan on being a one skew company. Innovation is bringing a product to the market that is really a paradigm shift. And, can re and when you do innovate, you capture people's imagination. In like nothing else, like it's, it's got nothing to do with just like um, evolutionary product. But ev innovative product really shifts a paradigm and really captures people's imagination. People's needs change all the time. You know, people are not standing still. And uh, if you innovate then and develop new products, then you can meet new needs that develop. Secondly, 
you know, obviously you want to, even for the old needs like communication, you want to keep improving and solving those problems better and better. So instead of having, obviously instead of having regular landline phones, we have cell phones out of innovation. You can just keep improving, improving, solving people, you know, fulfilling people's needs better and better. And then also, I think innovation can delight. And, you know, you can't be in this society, in a consumer society, without realizing that products and new products can make people's lives better just for, out of the delight of the way they perform and what they do for you. You cannot grow unless you can innovate. And you know, it's a built into our breed that we want to grow our businesses and get bigger and bigger. Um, for the consumer, again, it's, it's solving those problems that people have, those needs that people have, better and better, and just making progress. Um, that's what so much of people's lives are about these days. It's just um, figuring out how to solve their problems and you know uh, make life more enjoyable through products. But I'm very uh, insistent on when you ask, on answering the question of what's the next big thing on being fully honest that I have no idea. I know that I know that the ripstick is the big thing now, but the next big thing I'm going to be walking on the street somewhere or at some trade show and see some little uh, little booth with somebody you know with a product that I think is just great, and that item is going to turn into the next big thing. Very unlikely it's going to come out of this head. Well, I have to say my favorite right now is my ripstick, which is my next Razor scooter. It's, it's an incredible new way of getting around uh, uh, on, for kids to have fun. It's a, it's a two-wheel skateboard style product and, uh, with casters. We call it a caster board. And you uh, sway your hips and carve, and that's how you move forward. So that's my, that, you know, my, but my, of course, the product closest to my heart is, is the Razor scooter because it has that longevity. You know, and the ability to sell more and more items every year and really touch the hearts and, and, and feet of children all over the country. Uh, I have to say that, you know, after we came out with the Razor Scooter, we, you know, had a para paradigm for our business, which was to um, reinvent classic toys. And we decided that the next thing we would try would be a uh, uh, pogo stick. So we took a traditional pogo stick and removed the spring in the center and put an air piston in. And it folded like the Razor Scooter. It was made out of shiny aluminum. I thought, well, this is just exactly like the Razor Scooter. It's just full of innovation. Um, problem was, uh, with all this innovation, it became $100 pogo sticks. And most pogo sticks are $19. <laughs> so we had a hard time. That was a painful lesson that I learned, is that um, for something to be expensive in the marketplace, far more expensive than what is traditionally out there, it has to really be one of those one in a million products that just is so compelling. And that's hard to do intentionally over and over again. You know, that's a, that can happen to one person maybe once in a lifetime. But that's why we look often outside the company for inventors to find those one in a million ideas because there's millions of those. Trying to do it internally, that's, that's the tough part where you try to be, you can only be so innovative on the inside.